So let's talk a little bit about an overview of what um, our legislature has done to date um, that, that can affect employers and employment lawsuits. I'll give you a quick summary and then we'll, we'll go into a little more detail on each of these. Um, the first is House Bill 2678, which um, uh, amends the type of interest that will be um, afforded to judgments, including em uh, employment discrimination lawsuits. Um, Senate Bill 402 um, restricts uh, covenants not to compete between physicians and hospitals. Uh, Senate Bill 222 um, is near and dear to my heart, and we'll talk about why that is a little later today, uh, which disqualifies um, striking employees from unemployment compensation. And you say, well, Kevin, I thought they already were. Uh, unfortunately, I'm living proof uh, that they are not, but this is a, a fix um, that the legislature has put in place. Senate Bill 224 um, fixes some problems with the wage bond process, particularly for employers who have active operations already within the state, but launch a sub or uh, a sister company or something like that. Uh, it, it exempts them from the wage bond requirements. Um, Senate Bill 330 is, uh, it's called Technical Changes to the West Virginia Workplace Freedom Act, otherwise known as Right to Work, and it should fix at least one of the issues um, with the, the Right to Work bill from last session, which is currently at the Supreme Court. However, we'll talk to you a little bit about um, prognosticating what will happen with that bill at the Supreme Court. Set, uh, Senate Bill 76 is the Second Chance for Employment Act that relates to a modification of criminal records and uh, certainly affects employer decisions going forward as to hiring uh, and what to ask for when hiring about criminal backgrounds. Um, House Bill 2857 is the West Virginia Safer Workplace Act. Um, presumptively, the, the workplaces are safe. Now we're making them safer, and that has to do with drug testing, uh, and it really is a fundamental change. Uh, to the methodology uh, and the law around drug tests and employers acting on those drug tests. And then finally, um, Senate Bill 386 uh, is the West Virginia Medical Cannabis Act, uh, which uh, certainly is going to have an impact on employers uh, beginning in 2019. So that's the, those are the highlights. Jay, did I miss any? I don't think so. Uh, with that, we'll move on to one that is certainly tangentially related employers, uh, those uh, in particular who might have a, a judgment against them. Jay? All right. Well, thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, this first one we're going to address is changes the uh, interest rate for pre-judgment and post-judgment interest. It's pretty short and sweet. Um, that being said, it doesn't take effect until the beginning of next year, so January 1, 2018. Uh, and what it does, it establishes that judgments shall bear simple interest. Uh, according to the old statute, it just said judgments shall bear interest, which had uh, kind of been interpreted to mean compound interest, and this clarifies that issue. Uh, additionally, it changes the uh, interest rate that is set by the Supreme Court of Appeals each year um, and says that that cannot exceed 9% or be less than 4% per annum. Uh, now, that is a change from the old bill, which made the range in between 7 and 11 percent. Uh, not a whole lot to say more than that. And uh, next, we have Senate Bill 402, the limiting covenants not to compete between physicians and hospitals. Uh, its effective date is July 6, 2017. Um, and interestingly and notably, it applies only to contracts entered into after July 1, 2017. Um, now, the uh, statute applies to covenants not to complete, compete between a physician and an employer. However, an employer is broadly defined under the statute to mean any person employing at least one individual in the state or any agent of an employer employing at least one individual in the state. So while it says that it's between physicians and hospitals, it's really between a physician and any employer employing a physician. Um, now, what the statute does is it limits those covenants to compete to only one year in duration, and cannot, they cannot exceed 30 road miles from the physician's primary practice. Uh, this bill has also been referred to as the Physician's Freedom of Practice Act. Uh, this bill also has some pretty significant exemptions that, it, uh, that do not fall within its uh, applicability, and those are where a physician sells his or her business to his, her, his or her employer. Uh, you can have any type of uh, restrictions you want with uh, covenants not to, any type of covenants not to compete you want with those uh, deals and transactions. 
and also does not apply to contracts between physicians who are shareholders, owners, partners, members, or directors of a practice. Now, a couple of uh, practice points um, with this is with this with this bill is that you really need to. It really highlights that you need to have you, all of your uh, covenants not to compete subject to legal review before you uh, before you push them out there, so that you can be sure that they're enforceable and they do what you want to do. Um, additionally, uh, because these uh, these these bills don't uh, it does not apply to contracts entered into uh, before July 1, 2017. That gives you guys about a month. To come up with uh, to kind of renegotiate and not be subject, not have those covenants be subject to this bill. So that's just something to keep in mind. Moving okay. on, Kevin. Yeah, so I told you this was near and dear to my heart, and the, I don't put this on my calling card, and it certainly is not uh, something I'm proud of. But you're you're listening to uh, the loser of the largest unemployment case in the history of West Virginia, uh, the Kroger workers. Uh, as any of us who uh, like to shop at Kroger, um, no, went on strike uh, about a decade ago. And uh, although they went on strike, um, they were afforded unemployment compensation benefits. And uh, the unemployment compensation benefits really changed the balance of power when employees are able to subsidize uh, their strike with replacement income at taxpayer and, um, and, and corporate taxpayer expense. Um, the, uh, this really doesn't change uh, much in the way the law normally works. The way the no law normally works is that if an employee of a union um, uh, shop goes out on strike, they shouldn't get benefits, although in some cases they have in the past. Uh, and if they are locked out by the employer, uh, then they do get unemployment compensation benefits. Um, this, um, this statute um, clarifies the statute. I, I am a little bitter and I apologize. Uh, Jay, but it clarifies a statute that, in my opinion, never needed clarifying, but makes it absolutely and unequivocally clear um, that uh, striking workers do not get unemployment benefits. Um, for those of you on the phone who are unionized employers, and I'm looking at the list and note, note several of you that are, it certainly crystallizes the importance when you get down to last, best, and final offer time um, of making sure that it is unequivocal that we are offering them the opportunity to continue to work under the last um, contract that they had that's expiring, and that if any decision is made not to work, we classify that clearly as a strike uh, such that we can be sure that they will not get unemployment uh, compensation. Uh, again, uh, the majority of the people on the line are not unionized, so um, why do you care? Well, I think there's certainly an argument that if even absent a union, a group of employees uh, and a group meaning two or more decided to hold out and not come to work um, because uh, they are um, protesting, let's say, a modification reduction in their PTA or pay time off. Um, uh, we, we certainly um, need to make sure that we classify those two people as striking workers and not workers that we, um, that we lock out or uh, uh, we could run the risk of those folks getting unemployment compensation as well. So, um, again, near and dear to my heart uh, is this clarification of a statute which really didn't need clarifying. Jay. All right. How about wage bonds? All right. Now, Senate Bill 224 uh, repealed some, some uh, requirements for wage bonds that apply to certain employers. Uh, the effective date of this statute is later next month, July 7, 2017. Um, and it applies only to employers who are engaged in the construction industry or in the severance production and transportation of minerals. And uh, what this bill requires is that if you've been doing business um, in the state for less than one year, uh, you need to post a wage bond with the state. Uh, and the amount of that bond is equal to 15 or equal to the gross payroll uh, at full capacity for four uh, for four weeks plus an additional 15 percent of whatever that total may be. Um, now there's some pretty pretty with this just like the uh, restrictions on covenants not to compete with physicians. There's some pretty big exceptions to this rule, and those are for employers who have been in the business in another state uh, for five years, or who have over a hundred thousand dollars in assets, or who are a subsidiary of a parent company that has been in business for five years. Um, so those lots lots of companies that do start up 
uh, in the state, you know, fall into one of those three categories and uh, would not have to post a wage bond. But those who do, you have to uh, file a quarterly report for the first year verifying the number of your employees. Uh, that's down from two years uh, under the old statute. Um, yep, so certainly, uh, Kevin, certainly a, a, a new business, employer-friendly uh, modification um, in those industries um, to encourage uh, individuals to make it easier to do business in West Virginia. Um, you can terminate the bond after the first after that first year uh, right. if you if you meet the certain requirements. Okay. Yeah. So the Workplace Freedom Act, otherwise known uh, as uh, Right to Work, a couple things about Right to Work before we get into this these modifications to give you background. Um, as most of the folks on the line um, know, West Virginia passed this. Um, West Virginia Workplace Freedom Act last legislative session, which made West Virginia um, uh, join, join the growing number of states that have become right to work. Uh, right to work simply uh, means that um, union security clauses that used to require either um, a membership in a union or the payment of fees equal to union dues um, as a requirement of continued employment become illegal under these statutes. Um, you know, uh, I may be in the minority of labor lawyers on this. Uh, right to work um, may help the bargaining position of unionized employers, but really needs to be um, on the radar screen of employers who don't have a union. Um, what happens in, in my experience, uh, and it's been the case this past year in West Virginia, and certainly is the case in right to work states where I work regularly, um, it makes uh, union membership drop off um, in with employers. The union doesn't go away. The union still has to represent the, the, the workers who belong uh, in the union. They're just not getting paid as much for that work. And as those of you on the phone know, who uh, obviously who are in business, when revenues decrease, um, you can either normally normal businesses can either um, cut expenses. Uh, or increase revenues or, or both. Um, unfortunately, the union's not able to cut expenses too much and that again, they still have to represent the employers at uh, any employer, uh, the employees rather at the employer, uh, but they're just not getting paid as much for it. So they're really focused on increased revenues. Uh, unions um, uh, survive and, and on the revenue of dues, period. Uh, they're, they're, not, they're not grants, they're not nonprofits. They have to have more dues. So as a result, um, what, what I've seen in right to work states in West Virginia over the past 12 months has been no example. Unions push out into areas to organize employers that they wouldn't have organized before to replace those lost revenues uh, caused by right to work, which means um, we are working with employers today and have over the last 12 months in industries that have never uh, been uh, unionized in the past. I've never, it's never, never been an attempt. Typically, they're union industry uh, outside of heavy industry, et cetera, and it increases the activity in that state of union organization to replace those dues. And so, um, those of you on the phone uh, who are union understand that when you're negotiating a collective bargaining agreement, we recommend a provision that says when right to work is said and done that the security provision comes out. Those of you who are on the phone who, rep who are in a business who said, Kevin, there's no way a union would ever want any of my employees, I'm here to tell you that that was the same song that about a dozen clients of mine now are singing or were singing up to a year ago. Um, they're, they're targets now more so than they were a year before. So uh, that is, um, that's right to work and it's global impact on, on our state. Certainly a good thing in terms of being a check mark in the box, Jay, for new companies who want to come in and locate in West Virginia, who have decided that a right to work state is a prerequisite to coming here, but something that also has some unintended consequences on on non uh, union clients. Kevin, tell us a little bit about the uh, litigation that's going on with right to work right now. Sounds good. So unsurprisingly, uh, unions were not um, pleased with West Virginia's um, um, statute last year and filed litigation. They drew Judge Bailey in Kanawha County, who's a fine human being, but who did enter an order uh, preliminary and then uh, a final permanent order 
um, in joining the act um, as unconstitutional on two grounds. Uh, number one, um, there was, it was not the best drafted um, right to work piece of legislation uh, I've seen, and there was confusion as to the applicability uh, to uh, state employ employers only or to all employers, et cetera, et cetera. That was one basis, that ambiguity that Judge Bailey found um, made the statute um, uh, unlawful, and um, that has been corrected with the technical changes to the West Virginia Workplace Freedom Act. However, um, the second uh, basis uh, that the union, uh, the union plaintiffs asserted was that this statute effectively created an unconstitutional governmental taking of their property, i.e. their dues. And that ha issue has not been addressed um, by this technical change. And so the statute does not, um, contrary to so how some um, have portrayed it, I don't believe um, it is going to obviate the need for the Supreme Court to look at the issue. Uh, it is before the Supreme Court now. I still think they have to address and they will address uh, the takings argument as to whether or not the state is or the statute is unconstitutional as an unlawful government taking. At the end of the day, these challenges have failed in most states on the takings basis. I believe we will become a right to work state. Uh, and um, I believe it's a matter of time before the Supreme Court, certainly with the current majority up there, um, upholds the statute. All right. So now we're, we want to talk about the Second Chance for Employment Act. Jay, you want to talk about that initially? Sure. Uh, all right. Well, uh, this is, like Kevin said, the Second Chance for Employment Act, and it allows certain uh, people convicted of nonviolent, non-sexual felonies to petition for a reduction of that offense to misdemeanor status. Uh, its effective date is, late again, later next month, July 7, 2017. And what this means for employers is that uh, if an individual is qualified for such a reduction, he or she does not have to disclose that uh, felony on an application for employment. Now, the Act also provides some uh, limited civil immunity for uh, hiring individuals who have had these reductions. Uh, for example, uh, an employer may not be held liable solely for hiring an individual who has uh, had received a um, reduced offense. Um, the fact that an individual has a conviction, had, a, had a conviction reduced may not be introduced into evidence uh, in a negligent hiring action. However, in actions relating to failure to provide adequate supervision, uh, the fact that an employee has had a conviction reduced may uh, not be introduced to evidence unless the employer knew of the conviction or was grossly negligent in not knowing of the conviction and the conviction or reduced offense was directly related to the work and the conduct that gave rise to that action. So what that means is employers need to make a conscious decision as to whether or not they want to know about any reduced offenses. Uh, so for example, you may be inclined to put a, um, uh, something on an application for employment that says, have you ever had any type of uh, offense expunged or reduced? And uh, it may tell you what you want to know, and you may not hire that person for that. However, knowing you do, you are you do have knowledge of that at that point. So if you do hire the individual, and uh, you know they they bring someone later brings a claim for uh, inadequate supervision, um, you do meet one of those two uh, those two factor tests that that might come into that might come into evidence if the offense was directly related to the work and the conduct that gave rise to the action. Um, Additionally, this uh, this doesn't this, this statute doesn't apply to uh, individuals who are engaging in the prevention, detection, investigation, or prosecution of persons for violations of the law. So, for example, police officers or prison guards, this uh, they still are required to report all the convictions uh, that they have received, even if they are expunged or reduced. Yeah, and if you break this down, um, I would say probably in the mid to late '90s. Um, there was kind of a cottage industry in West Virginia of, of adding account to, to complaints uh, for negligent hiring and supervision. And they were kind of lumped together. The plaintiffs would say, uh, look, uh, you're, they sue a home health organization because um, somebody that they hired um, stole from their client and, or abused their client or what have you. And they would sue under this kind of combined theory of, of, of um, negligent hiring and supervision uh, because the employer 
either didn't do a criminal background investigation, perhaps they weren't in the, an, an industry that was regulated uh, to the extent it was required to have one, uh, or it did do a background in investigation and hired the person anyway. Um, this really, um, as I've always thought, breaks down those components to two acts. The, the initial hiring of the individual who has a record uh, and, and has a record that has a conviction that has been reduced, and the supervision. So there are really two components with two different duties. On the hiring end, if someone has um, a reduced conviction that, um, that but for that reduction wouldn't have been hired, but we hire them because it was reduced, we're okay under the law. We can't be sued for negligent hiring. However, our obligation um, to uh, supervise that individual um, is heightened in that um, it is now, it, it is only a problem or is a problem if we knew or should have um, or were grossly negligent in not knowing of it. So I think the hiring decision, we have a little more leeway to hire someone and not ask for a reduced conviction uh, um, scenario. On the supervision, our duty to supervise individuals is certainly heightened if we knew that they do have a reduced one. So. I'm not sure exactly how most employers are going, to come, are going to come down on this. My guess is, Jay, they probably will not ask um, if they have a reduced conviction, but I'm not sure how clients are going to want to proceed. All right, next is the Safer Workplace Act. Okay, we're going to, we're going to spend a little bit more time on this one. Um, I'll give you a little background. Um, drug testing in West Virginia, and I would not be uh, surprised if folks on the phone are surprised to hear what the extent of the current law is in West Virginia. Um, drug testing in West Virginia is not nearly as easy than in the vast majority, if not all of the states um, in which we practice. Uh, certainly in my experience, West Virginia is more restrictive on when individuals can properly drug test and gives a lot more latitude to plaintiffs who sue under a violation of privacy and constitutional rights to privacy uh, who have been drug tested. Under, uh, under uh, West Virginia, current West Virginia law, which is in effect from um, the early 90s to July 7th, 2017, for, for the next uh, month and change, um, there is a case called Twig versus Hercules that governs those drug tests. And basically, um, Twig, Hercules, and the cases who have, uh, or which have interpreted that case, finds that there is essentially a presumption that a drug test violates an individual's right to privacy, which is kind of true, um, and that any drug test then has to fall in to an exception to that, that privacy right, and that, that the interest in conducting a drug test much, must outweigh the individual's right to privacy. Um, that applies to employer-employee relationships, not employer prospective employee relationships. Our ability to test prospective employees was and will remain after this statute much broader than our ability to, to test um, current employees. Um, and from the 90s through 2017, um, the ability to drug test um, is really defined as uh, and fairly limited to um, non-safety sensitive position folks uh, of whom we have a reasonable suspicion uh, are under the influence of, of prohibited substances or uh, somehow we have reasonable suspicion that they have violated our drug testing policy, including specimen, um, specimen adulteration and testing of individuals uh, for cause or randomly for those individuals who occupy a safety sensitive position in West Virginia. And you would be surprised, because I think most people are surprised, at, at our court's willingness to limit those uh, areas of safety-sensitive um, positions to ones which, to me, uh, are, are certainly too limiting. So, for instance, um, if an individual is, in my mind, if an individual is working at a chemical plant and they're controlling um, uh, electronic um, valves, et cetera, on a chemical reaction process, and if they are stoned or drunk, could miss a cutoff and blow up the neighborhood, 
to me, that seems like a safety-sensitive position. Yet our courts have held that in under the facts in a case that, that were almost identical to that, that was not a safety-sensitive position. Um, certainly, I believe that um, uh, that an individual who administers uh, psychotherapeutic services while not writing drugs, perhaps a psychologist or a therapist, and are going to be working as an intervener with someone in crisis who commits suicide, um, if they were high or drunk, may not participate uh, in that counseling session at the highest and best level. I would think that would be a safety-sensitive position. Uh, from the 90s through July 7th, 2017, that's not a safety-sensitive position, and therefore random drug tests would not be sufficient. We would have to have some observable phenomenon of uh, indicating that the person was impaired in order to um, to administer a drug suit. Um, additionally, if someone was in an accident, I would be surprised if there's not at least a representative of one employer or more on the phone who would say, well, if they have an accident, we do post-accident testing, period. Well, that in West Virginia is illegal unless, in addition to the fact that they wrecked the forklift, they also uh, smelled of alcohol or had some other kind of, 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 of presentation of some type of impairment. We could not simply use the accident as the reasonable suspicion to test. That's, that's the current state of the law. If anybody on the phone has, um, has violated it, uh, you need not raise your hand, and you may breathe easier um, in that effective July 7th, 2017, our legislature has made it much more predictable uh, and much more clear as to um, the nature of tests and testing protocols that are approved and provided a high degree of insulation from liability for employers who act on it. So between now and July 7th, if you can hold off on testing, um, um, great. Spend your time working on putting in a policy that complies with the new act to launch on July 7th uh, and will avoid what is um, a, a very high number of, of employment cases involving violations of, of privacy for individuals who even test positive yet are found uh, and awarded um, monies on the basis that the underlying test uh, was administered improperly. So, Let's talk about the new statute, which I think makes an employer's um, uh, process going forward much clearer. Um, number one, um, big picture, the act sets forth um, a requirement that if we want to test, doesn't say we have to test, but if we want to test and we want to enjoy the immunity afforded us in this statute, then we must have a written policy and it must have in it various components that are set forth in the statute that we'll highlight for you today. So number one, if you want to test, you better have it in writing. And if you're going to have it in writing and test, you, you need to go ahead and make sure that your policy complies with the act so that you enjoy immunity. If you have a written policy and it fails to meet any one of the components that are required in the act, we don't get the immunity. So if we're going to test, need it in writing, policy must have the components that are set forth in the statute. Um, number two is it dovetails um, um, drug failure to failure of a drug test to workers' comp eligibility, which is uh, already in our statute, but it clarifies and makes it um, uh, more of an if-then proposition. If we have a statute that comply or a policy that complies with the statute, individuals hurt at work, individual test policy positive in connection with the act or sorry, with the accident, they are not eligible for workers' comp. And it also dovetails it neatly to the unemployment statute. The unemployment statute to, to date has been interpreted uh, in an inconsistent fashion by the various ALJs who hear unemployment cases. Some judges only want, will disqualify an individual from eligibility for unemployment if that individual is observed uh, acting in a way that suggests he or she was impaired um, and that a simple positive test is not enough. Some judges will let a positive test serve as a disqualifying event. This statute um, clarifies that roadmap and should correct the inconsistencies. And if we have a, pol a written policy and that written policy has the components set forth in the statute and that the individual tests positive and we terminate that individual for testing positive, that positive test in and of itself will be enough to disqualify the employee from unemployment compensation eligibility. So a couple of... Um, 
before we talk about the components, the Act starts with um, some basic requirements of, of the new statute. Um, number one, it does away with any distinction between prospective employees, uh, applicants for employment, and employees. Basically says, um, under the Act, if you, ha again, if you have the written policy that has the right, um, the right components, um, employers can attest um, applicants and employees for drug and alcohol. Um, it does not apply to those employers who are covered by other statutes. Um, the, you know, the FAA um, has um, drug testing requirements that apply to pilots. This act is inapplicable uh, to employers who, who test under the auspices of the FAA. Um, the um, individuals who have CDL uh, are tested under DOT regulations. This act does not apply to the employees of an employer who are subject to the testing requirements of the DOT, et cetera. So if there is another statute, state or federal, which, which controls the drug testing requirements of an employer for certain types of employees, then as it relates to those employees, not necessarily to all the employees of that institution, but those employees that are covered by the drug testing regulations of that other statute are not covered um, by this statute. Um, it provides that, um, that all testing done under the statute to be testing that is protected by the statute, it's got to be conducted before, during, or immediately after a regular work period. It doesn't say immediately before, which again, it may be fertile ground for some lawyer uh, to, to litigate. Um, I, would, I would suggest to you that you imply the word immediately um, uh, in front of the word before so that immediately pre-shift, during a shift, or immediately after a regularly scheduled shift. I think the intent of the legislation was to not allow employers to drag in employees from um, the widespread panic concert on a Saturday night and get a test if they are not, um, if they are not scheduled to work. So all testing's gotta be conducted immediately before, immediately after, or during a regular work period. And it puts the burden, the financial burden, on all tests, all actual costs, all transportation if requested and necessary for an employee. All of those have to be borne by the employer um, unless it is a subsequent test where the employee challenges the validity of the underlying test. So um, we can test employees and prospective employees. It doesn't apply to uh, employers who are covered or employees of employers who are covered by another statute test before, during, or immediately after a regular shift, and employer pays everything. Those are kind of the fundamental tenets that the statute lays out. Um, in terms of the, um, the components of the statute, um, you have to, and meeting those components, if you do, then there is a host of defenses that an employer will have to a cause of action um, brought by the employee for an invasion of privacy. Um, we can take actions um, in discipline up to termination based on a positive uh, drug test, and there cannot be a lawsuit associated with the decision made to fire um, as long as we have complied with the statute. Um, we also um, have a um, immunity um, in any event, other than an event where we base it on a false positive that we knew and ignored that false uh, positive um, for any action short of termination. So if we um, take a person and require them to take an unleave, unpaid leave of absence, a suspension, you got to go to EAP, et cetera, we are immune from any of those actions um, if we made that decision. So essentially, if someone sues us, um, let's say for race discrimination or what have you, and, and as long as we have the policy in place and we followed it, our legitimate business reason um, will get deference. Our legitimate business reason was we have a policy that complies with the West Virginia Safer Workplace Act. We tested this person pursuant to that policy. We made our decision based on that policy. Race had nothing to do with it. So it can serve as a, as a, um, as a good faith basis and legitimate business reason in other types of lawsuits as well. Um, the 
there are some confidentiality, uh, again, before I get into the components of the drug test, there are some comp confidentiality provisions in the Act um, that, again, give us li uh, immunity from liability if we follow them. Number one, um, we can only uh, reveal the results of the test to someone um, in the need-to-know capacity. I'm sure that is best practice and always has been. I'm sure everybody on the phone complies with that. As long as we comply with that, um, we are um, immune from any type of defamation, uh, libel, or slander lawsuit brought with someone, or brought against someone, um, or brought against an employer by someone who tested positive and was fired uh, because of it. Um, there are heightened um, statutory requirements that didn't exist, but again, most people uh, followed them with respect to communications concerning um, testing, et cetera. And um, we would make cert we would want to make certain that, for instance, when the that we limit the reason why we're terminating for someone, uh, let's say the person was terminated for violating our drug-free workplace policy, we would want to make sure that that reason, the violation of the drug-free workplace policy, is limited to those in a need-to-know position. So executive leadership, probably. Um, human resources, yes. Uh, uh, supervisor, probably. Anybody else, probably not. So we need to make um, absolutely certain that we limit not only the results of the drug test, but the reason why we fired an individual if that reason was for failing a drug test, because I think that could serve to strip us of our immunity, Jay. Um, let's talk a little bit about um, a, uh, the components of the policy. And we've got about a month and, and change to scrub our existing policies to make sure that they comply um, with that. Um, again, to, policies can be written or unwritten in general. This, this is one of the types of policies that must be written. It must be written and disseminated to employees. It's one of those policies where it's my advice or our advice that it's, it's written, disseminated, we conduct training on it, and we get written acknowledgement that they were trained on it, had opportunities to ask questions about it, and um, certainly are agreeing to comply with it. So it's got to be written, it's got to be disseminated, et cetera. Um, we, um, the first um, component is our policy and procedure must comply with the statute's provisions on collection of samples. As I told you before, uh, one provision is the sample must be collected immediately before, immediately after, or during the regular work shift. Um, that, that, ha that should be in the policy. That has to be part of our procedure in order to meet that component um, uh, of the uh, policy. The employer is allowed to require reliable ID uh, from the person being um, from the person being tested. Um, again, we have to pay the actual cost. Uh, if we don't, then we don't have a compliant drug test, and therefore we don't have the immunity from liability. And we must provide it at our cost transportation, uh, whether it's our own car or truck or van, or we pay Uber. Uh, or whatever other me method of transportation um, if we are collecting the specimen at a site other than the work site. Um, another component has to do with the types of procedures utilized um, uh, for the collection of specimens. Um, they say that the collection of samples must be performed under reasonable and sanitary conditions. Pretty self-explanatory, and we would want that for uh, chain of custody and, and non-adulteration of the sample as well. Um, the testing procedure must include, uh, or if it includes an observer, must be that the observer of the specimen collection of urine sample be the same sex as the individual employee providing the sample. So to the extent we're utilizing a lab uh, or a MedExpress or, or some other facility to collect the specimen, obviously we're probably going to use a lab to test it, but if we're going to use an outside group to, to um, collect the specimen. We must be clear in our contract and arrangements with that that um, if it is an observed sample, that it needs to be of the same gender. If not, um, and uh, we don't have the statutory immunity afforded by the statute for a wrongful termination or an invasion of privacy claim. 
Um, there are requirements regarding proper labeling and chain of custody procedures, which in my experience are not always followed by labs. So I would make sure that in my agreement with the lab, there's some indemnification provision that if they screw up chain of custody or if they screw up labeling of samples, et cetera, they'll indemnify the employer if we're sued and, and, and lose the immunity under this statute. Um, there has to be um, an opportunity in connection with the test. And again, this is a vague, this is a vague area of the statute which may be litigated by a creative lawyer, uh, but an opportunity for the employee or prospective employee to voluntarily provide notification of any information which may be considered as relevant to the test, which would include those things like, uh, I'm on a controlled substance right now by prescription, uh, et cetera. Um, the, um, obviously that, I think that means that it needs to be done um, prior to the administration of the test. Most, uh, most labs will ask for a list of current prescriptions and provider information, et cetera. Um, a creative lawyer could argue that that means at any time. So yeah, I didn't tell you, oh, I tested positive. Hey, I've got my test. I think, our, I think we're still safe in having a policy that says that they must provide notification prior to the administration of the test. Um, there are requirements regarding um, a split sample that is subject uh, to confirmation. Um, to be, um, to have the statutory immunity, we have to utilize a lab that is certified by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Um, and uh, again, um, I would make certain that whatever agreement we have with our lab um, and or our specimen collection company indicate that they make a covenant that they are certified by the, uh, the DOH, um, or sorry, the Department of Health and Human Services um, to uh, test. Um, the, the next requirement is that the test has to be done with a separate confirmation. So um, there needs to be a two-part, again, split sample. Um, they can do an initial drug, drug, drug screen for a non-negative followed by a confirmation. Um, and it requires some type of uh, chromatographical um, gas chromatograph or what have you um, test as the, um, as the confirming test. In my experience, most of them do that as the confirming one. Um, the person also has to be afforded employee to be valid. The policy and procedure has to be that the employee has a basis and an opportunity to challenge the result. Uh, he can have the, uh, he or she may have uh, the split sample tested and we must provide for that. Um, opportunity such that the lab that we work with has to maintain a split sample that the, in, the in individual can utilize at another lab and the employee has to pay for that confirmation. Um, there are also a, a host of requirements relating to our policy and what, what it must include. Again, um, the written policy has to be distributed to every employee as we talked to you about. Um, we have we have an obligation that if we have access to, uh, and let's say, an EAP or some type of drug treatment or counseling as a benefit for our employees, we have to provide that information to employees. Of course, most good businesses want to tout that as a benefit for their employees. We need to, and again, we need to be able to prove that we provided it to employees to check the box under the statute that we have a complying policy. So in addition to providing information um, um, about EAPs, available counseling, um, drug treatment, et cetera, we need to be able to prove that we provided that. So I would put that in an employee's pre-hire paperwork or in some, uh, some type of orientation that we use to be able to demonstrate that we provided that information um, to an employee. Uh, our policy um, should or must actually provide in writing what we will or may do for positive results. Um, the statute lays out what we can do, and, and essentially um, we can do about anything we want. Uh, the statute says that we can have um, in an individual who uh, will not have a cause of action if we have a valid plan, if we suspend the employee with or without pay for a designated uh, period of time, if we terminate the employee, if we refuse to hire a prospective employee, and or other adverse employment action including uh, consistent with our policies, written policies and procedures. 
So essentially, we're allowed to declare a major as to what we're going to do with employees um, for who test positive and violate our policy in other ways, but we're going to have to tell them what we're going to do. Um, the question becomes whether or not we can put in uh, the language that most of us have in our policies that say may be subject to discipline up to and including termination of employment. I think that's okay. I don't know if that's okay, but I think it's okay. I do. I would not put it past a creative plaintiff's lawyer to say, yeah, you didn't tell them what you were going to do. You told them um, up to and including termination, which gave them a, a whole pantoply of potential options, et cetera. So they really didn't know how serious it could be. I'm not going to advise my clients to change that unless and until there's litigation about it, but that's something to be mindful of. I think certainly we want to be consistent for a host of other reasons with our application of the policy. And so I don't see any harm with an employer predefining what the response is going to be uh, for a positive drug test for other reasons, but at least in terms of to comply with this policy, I believe employers can maintain um, that language. For employees that, that are called under the statute sensitive employees, which I think um, does not apply to them um, having their feelings hurt easily, but instead they probably meant safety sensitive over at the legislature. Um, we have another option, and in the safety sensitive employee realm, uh, we can, in addition to suspend, terminate, refuse to hire, or take another adverse employment action, we can simply remove the person from the sensitive or safety sensitive position to a non-safety sensitive position at, according to the statute, comparable pay and benefits. Um, and not have any cause of action associated with that move as long as it's predicated on a positive test or violation of the policy and that policy meets the statute. So that seems to suggest that that's not an option for non-safety sensitive positions, which to me is counterintuitive. Um, but um, I still think we can move uh, individuals that we, if we want, uh, who are not safety sensitive, demote them or what have you. And for safety sensitive positions, can move them out of a safety sensitive position uh, to a, to a non-safety sensitive position. So um, essentially, um, if we do those things and we do have those components in our policy, someone tests positive um, or violates the policy, let's say by adulterating their um, specimen, um, the the we have immunity civil from civil liability for the cause of action predicated on the test, the administration of the test, uh, the relying on the results of the test, and as well as the affirmative defense. So it, it really does radically change the landscape of, of drug testing in West Virginia. And we've got about a month before the statute goes into effect. And I suggest that over the next month, we look hard at our policies to make sure that we're in a position to take advantage of the civil uh, liability immunity uh, come early July. What did I miss in that, Jay? I think you hit all the high points. Seems to be good. All right. I don't know if you did this on purpose, but speaking of high points, we will segue into the West Virginia Medical Cannabis Act. Um, as I would assume most everybody on the phone knows, West Virginia became the latest state uh, to enact legislation uh, permitting uh, medical cannabis uh, to be utilized within the states. Of course, we still have the federal overlay of its illegality and those issues, but the state is forging ahead as many states have. Um, essentially, we have now, um, or we will have the day after the 4th of July holiday, um, a medical marijuana program that's going to live within the um, Department of Health and Human Resources, uh, and the Bureau of Public Health will administer it. And it allows individuals with certain conditions um, beginning July 1, 2019, to receive a medical card from certain, uh, for certain conditions by certain certified uh, and approved physicians to utilize marijuana medicinally. Um, as you can imagine, um, that's going to bump into um, some of our, uh, our meaning employers, policies and procedures relating uh, to our drug um, our drug and alcohol test. And you'll say, well, Kevin, you just told us to put in a new policy. Do we have to put in something that deals with the Medical Cannabis Act? And my thought is, yeah, we should be thinking about that because in 2019, um, you're going to have to do it again if you don't now. So I think certainly incorporating some of the things we talk about under the Cannabis Act prospectively is not a bad idea 
um, for employers at this point. Um, some, some of those issues um, uh, kind of at the 35,000 foot view would be, well, can I still fire someone who tests positive um, for marijuana pursuant to my lawful drug test? And the answer is it depends. It depends on um, whether or not the one, whether or not the person has a valid prescription and can evidence uh, through the use of the medical marijuana card a valid prescription for that. And number two, were we fire him solely because he tested or he or she tested positive, or because he wasn't doing his job? And the statute provides essentially that we cannot make um, that decision based on the simple fact that the employee tested positive for marijuana if the person has a valid prescription for it. However, we may still um, administer discipline and regulate an employee um, who, while under the influence of lawfully prescribed marijuana, has a job performance level that is less than what we would qu require of a normal um, unstoned, is that right, Jay? I think that's correct. An unstoned um, employee. So we have the reasonable and prudent employee standard who is not um, uh, not uh, stoned, who is required to make 100 widgets an hour. And um, we have an employee who is on medical marijuana uh, who can only make 50 widgets an hour. Um, we can insist, uh, and if the person has enough, you know, I know somebody on the phone who's smart enough who's going to that's going to test me with a question and say, well, what about our duty to accommodate? Yes with or without reasonable accommodation can only produce 50 widgets an hour. Um, and um, we may discipline that employee because um, under the influence of marijuana, they're not able to make widgets like we expect for all of our other employees. So we're still allowed to make decisions based on productivity uh, and job performance, even though the person is on marijuana, but we may not fire someone simply for being on marijuana if their job performance is as a, a normal non-stoned employee would be. So if they're very good at working stoned, um, it is going to be difficult, if not impossible and illegal, to terminate them for the simple fact uh, that they're on marijuana. That does not apply to all physicians. Um, luckily, our legislature looked at um, at least some of, I don't believe all of yet, but some of the industries in our state um, where the use of medical marijuana would um, could impair an individual's um, right, ability to do a job safely. And they say, essentially, even if you're prescribed medical marijuana, you may not. It's a prohibition. Work, in it at, at, uh, work at heights or in confined spaces uh, while under the influence of marijuana. So that's not a, that, that, that's a shall not, not a, a suggestion. Um, we may also, um, as an employer make a decision that other occupations or tasks uh, within what we deem to be life-threatening um, um, create a public health or safety risk. Um, I would tell you that I would utilize the same type of analysis we've used for decades now under the, uh, the safety, uh, undue um, safety risk uh, under the Americans with Disabilities Act we would utilize the same type of scrutiny and not simply say, well, yeah, they work in a cotton ball factory, and if a whole barrel of cotton balls fell on somebody, it could really hurt them. We'd need to go through a process to determine whether or not a position, other than one of the specific provisions that involve heights or confined spaces, like, like mining or uh, other confined spaces, we'd need to go through that analysis uh, and use some vocational um, uh, folks as well. Um, there are some other um, prohibitions in the statute, like um, working with chemicals, with high voltage, with planes, trains, and automobiles, and other big equipment, et cetera. Um, luckily for, um, for health care, et cetera, there is a general prohibition on engaging in work, even if you have a valid prescription, where it could constitute negligence, professional malpractice, uh, professional misconduct. Um, there is also a general catch-all provision, uh, at least I think written into the Act sufficiently, to allow employers to utilize the same types of scrutiny that it would for people prescribed medical marijuana 
as they would for individuals who are lawfully prescribed other drugs that affect an individual's ability to perform. So if an individual, uh, if an individual is uh, prescribed narcotics, we may have um, a policy that says you got to notify us if you're on any uh, substance uh, that can adversely affect your, your, uh, the safety of you being able to do, or do your work safely, including but not limited to X, Y, Z, and medical marijuana. So we can still treat those individuals as we have treated those who are prescribed other narcotics. So, um, yes, we're talking about 2019. However, um, we shouldn't wait till 2019 to get that done. And I think it's a good time to try to work it in uh, to uh, prospectively to our uh, revised uh, drug testing and drug-free workplace policy. With that, I, that's all the the, uh, the data we have to cover with you guys. Um, we would certainly answer any questions you have. April, we have anybody chiming in? Give you guys another minute or so. <clears throat> Additionally, feel free to you know, send questions to either Kevin or myself. Our emails are located at the beginning of this PowerPoint presentation, um, and we will you know, do our best to assist you in that. And probably at no charge. Is that right, Jay? Well, I'd have One to, free question. I'd have to speak with my supervisor. But, uh. <laughs> so, yes, if you do have any questions, uh, Jay makes a good point. Email us uh, on that. We won't even send you a bill. With that, I'll get let you guys get on with the rest of your Thursday. We really do appreciate every single one of you uh, tuning in today and look forward to having more of these in the future. Thank you. Thanks.